I'm Danny Dyer, and this is the Real Football Factories International. I played Tommy Johnson in the film The Football Factory, which was all about football violence. Then I travelled to UK and met the real football firm. Now, I'm going international. Nine countries in two months. Around the hooligan world in 60 days. A whole new level of football violence. We'll be in riots. We'll get tear gas. Chase and even shot at. It's going to be quite a trip. Argentina is famous for its football. Of all the successful nations in the modern game, it has provided more drama and excitement than anywhere else. As well, we know. But Argentina is not only famous for its passion on the pitch, the terraces of South America's second largest country contain arguably the most passionate and violent football hooligans in the world. The problem of football violence in Argentina is getting worse and worse and worse. This week I'm going to be 7,000 miles away from London, in Argentina, in the capital city of Buenos Aires. I'm going to one of the biggest derbies in South America, Independiente versus Racing Club. It's one of the most explosive matches in the world. Argentina has one of football's worst hooligan problems. It's a secretive and closed world. But despite this, I'm going to get an audience with one of the most notorious football hooligans and leader of the biggest firm in the world. And my trip here has coincided with one of the biggest crises in the history of Argentinian football. I'm walking into the eye of a hooligan storm. Coming to Argentina had taken me as far off my manner as I'd ever been in my life. And the 18 hour journey had taken it out of me. On my travels, I'd been to quite a few countries in a short space of time. So Christ knows what time zone I was in. But one thing I did know was that Buenos Aires was a dangerous place and trouble could be lurking around any corner. Better jog on, might turn nasty. Today it's a bustling city of nearly 13 million people and a popular destination with tourists and travellers. And it's a city that was built by visitors. In the mid to late 19th century, immigrants from Europe began populating Buenos Aires, and with them, they brought football. The game has early origins in Argentina. The Football League was established just four years after the English one, and before any in mainland Europe. The popularity of the game spread quickly, and football became part of the DNA of Argentina. In this country, to belong to a team, it's so important. And perhaps you don't have anything. You only have this to belong. You understand? And when football is all you have, it becomes a religion. It's difficult for a person that doesn't live here in, in Buenos Aires or in Argentina to understand the craziness that people get with football. But that passion all too easily goes too far. Argentina has a brutal history of football violence. Over 200 people have been killed since the first incident way back in 1939, when two supporters were shot at a match. But organized hooligans did not come onto the scene until the 70s. They became known as the Barra Brothers, which translates as brave gangs. The gang mentality in Argentina is very, very strong, especially since the clubs are seen as defenders of their neighborhood. And nowhere is the gang mentality stronger than in Buenos Aires. 
I'm in the city that has more football teams than anywhere else in the world. It's a football mad melting pot. And with the largest amount of football teams, you have the highest number of firms, football firms that I've come in to meet. Say hola to Ariel Leon. He used to be a Barra brother back in the 80s and 90s. His team was Vélez Sarsfield and he was part of the firm for 10 years. Cuando creces ahí adentro, perdes ciertos miedos, capaz que tiene la gente normal, que es a pelearse, a, a estar en ese ambiente que generalmente a cualquier persona le daría miedo. Generalmente la violencia es toda física y generalmente en las barras siempre hay un grupo determinado que es el que va armado. Pero ya cuando generalmente los enfrentamientos armados son cuando es algo planeado ya. In England during the 70s and 80s, motorway service stations provided the opportunity for rival firms to meet and fight. Here in Buenos Aires today, it's at the toll booths on the roads that surround the city. Every weekend in Buenos Aires, hundreds of buses filled with Barra's brothers crisscross the city to get to games. So when they meet at these toll booths, it's a chance for them to attack each other. Ariel knows about these battles because he was involved in one and it spelt the end of his days as a Barra brother. 40, 50 personas de River que seguramente serían de la Barra. Y bueno, nosotros éramos tres micros de Vélez y no, o sea, hubo agresiones, rompieron todos los micros, todos nosotros no pudimos bajar del micro. Vino la policía, se paró y cuando bajamos todo el micro, el micro tenía 16 agujeros de bala y ningún herido y arriba del micro había 60 personas. It's not always lucky though. In April 2003, a battle between Barra Brothers of River Plate and Newell's Old Boys resulted in two fans being killed. So to understand the passion and the violence of Argentinian football, I needed to experience a game firsthand. And I'm going to one of the biggest. It's the Clasico de Avellaneda. It's Independiente versus Racing Club. And if you thought the derbies in England had atmosphere, then think again. I think I've shit me pants. So join me after the break in the madhouse that is Argentinian football. Welcome back to the International Football Factories. This week I'm in Argentina and being an Englishman, believe you me, I've got to keep me nut down. Don't you know I'm local? I'm in the capital, Buenos Aires, 7,000 miles from home. And as far as football hooliganism is concerned, it really is a different world out here. Argentina is a country with a history of violence. In 1943, a military coup ousted the constitutional government. It was the start of 40 years of military rule, coup and counter-coup, violence and bloodshed. During the second half of the 20th century, military leaders used extreme measures against those seen to oppose the dictatorship. In the late 70s and early 80s, human rights groups estimate that over 30,000 people were disappeared. It's believed that they were arrested and secretly executed without trial. Violence is endemic in Argentinian society. It's part of life here. And with football being one of the nation's greatest passions, the two elements became entwined to produce a culture of football violence. In the weeks leading up to my arrival, Argentinian hooligans from various clubs had been dominating the headlines. Racing club banned Boca Juniors Barras Brothers from a match. But when a judge overturned that ban, the game was called off because they said they couldn't provide the necessary security. Then there's Gymnasia's firm, who threatened the team with death if they won. And during the game between Newell's Old Boys and Rosario, there was almost tragedy. The two sets of fans began throwing stones at one another, and the police reacted by firing rubber bullets at the Newell's fans.
Just your average month for the Barras Bravas of Argentinian football. And the game I'm going to is one of the most volatile fixtures in the country. Now, what's the Spanish for bulletproof fest? It's one of the biggest derbies in Buenos Aires, and it takes place in the district of Avellaneda. The two clubs, Independiente and Racing Club, are just 300 meters apart. It's Sunday afternoon, and I'm going to the game, and it's a fixture that's seen trouble galore. In 2001, more than 100 people were injured after Racing's firm, the Racing Stones, attacked Independiente during the game. And later that same year, a Racing fan was killed after being stabbed 17 times. Independiente Stadium, the Estadio Libertadores de America, is a far cry from the modern arenas we're used to seeing at home. It was a proper old school ground with a rough and ready feel. It felt a bit like going back in time. I arrived in the scorching hot midday sun to meet up with the head of their firm. This is Pablo Alvarez, or Babote, which means big baby. He's the leader of the Independiente Barra Brothers, the Red Devils. I was meeting him inside the ground four hours before kickoff. Now this was very strange, meeting the top boy of the firm inside the ground and the surrealness didn't stop there. The first thing he did was made me help carry a load of bin bags. We're off to there. What's happening here? Jesus Christ. What on earth could be in them? I think it's a bag full of machetes. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They're just all balloons. They were balloons with a no to violence message on them, which the firm were going to be blowing up. To say things were strange would be an understatement. I was more used to meeting geezers in balaclavas. Babote, however, had a kid on his knee holding a no to violence balloon. Was this the sublime or the ridiculous? Is there often um, a lot of violence at the game? No, violencia hay en Argentina, no, no en el fútbol. Violencia hay en la sociedad. Que, que, que de ahí vaya a cada sector de, de, de parte, como la cancha de fútbol, un baile, en todos lados hay violencia. Trataremos de que no pase nada hoy acá, pero a la hora de defenderse todo el mundo se va a defender. Nosotros no somos de ir a buscar problemas a otro lado, sino nos defendemos y no vienen a buscar nada más. So according to Babote, the problems of violence at Argentinian football were a thing of the past. Now I can't help but get the sense that Pablo and his little firm, they're very cagey about it. They don't like to give too much away, which is a first for me because every club I've ever met, every firm, it's all bravado, it's all about the violence, it's about, you know, being dangerous, being naughty, you know. So for me, it makes it a little bit more sinister, you know. It's a bit more, you know, he knows what he's about. He, he ain't got to tell me nothing, really. Um, I don't blame him. Look at the old Bill. Waiting around for something to happen, clearly. I was about to enter the poplar, the Red Devil's End behind the goal, a place where even the police won't go. Maybe there wouldn't be any trouble. Maybe today would pass off without incident. Was it going to be heaven or hell? I'd ever been in. I wasn't sure whether I was in a football ground or in a nut house. This is mad, crazy. 
40,000 fans were crammed into the stadium. Probably the noises. The noises of everyone. There's no booze here. You don't need it. It's a party atmosphere without the booze, man. In fact, it was more like a rain. I was pumped full of adrenaline. It was quite unlike anything I'd experienced. A mixture of excitement and trepidation. There's me man, Pablo. It's just gone mad now, absolutely insane. I think my head's going to pop off. Fuck! It felt lawless, like anything could happen. I was glad that I was wrapped round Robote, because in here, he is the law. Over at the other end of the ground, the racing end looked to be equally mental. And there was still half an hour to go till the kickoff. It was so noisy, I didn't even realise the game had started. But seven minutes in, the volume was about to be raised. Well, they've got a penalty now, it's going to erupt this gaff, my life. was all a bit of a blur. It was so intense that Babate couldn't guarantee our safety and so he led us out of the poplar and ran to the other safer side of the ground. I finally had a chance to get my breath back. We've just had to get out of there, it's just gone too mad for us. I mean, for me it's probably the most frightened, frightened I've ever been. But I can't believe, looking back on where I was just plotted, I'm popping my pants looking at it for me, I was just in the middle of it. What's the matter with me? I was beginning to understand the passion and volatility of Argentinian football. I'll tell you what, they ain't shy of a tackle out there. There ain't no one pulling out of a tackle, I'm telling you. They're absolutely kicking each other to bits. You know, it feeds onto the players, you know, the support. There's no two ways about it. At half time, the racing firm decided to provide their own entertainment. They're all surging backwards and forwards, running about. I ain't got a clue what's going on. It's absolute chaos over there. They've got good voice, man. They're a proper firm at all, definitely. I'm glad I'm in the middle of it. But everything that had gone on so far was nothing compared to what was about to take place. A second Independiente goal at the start of the second half was the catalyst for a major incident. The racing fans were well pissed off. With half an hour to go, their team were facing humiliation at the hands of their bitter rivals. The match was about to come to a premature end. Something was happening at the racing end. It felt like trouble. The racing Barra Brabbers started throwing stones at the Independiente fans. The ref had to stop play. The police enter the racing end and fire tear gas. There's a standoff, and then the violent snowballs. Racing have just absolutely kicked off with the old bill. Tear gas, smoke bombs, absolute chaos over there. The chief of the operative that is coming is very preoccupied. Eh, vamos a ver, a ver qué, qué es lo que él resuelve. Sigue jugando unos minutitos más para ver si, si dejaban de, de tratar de suspender el partido, que me parece que es el fin que ellos quieren lograr. After 10 minutes, the escalating violence means the ref has no choice but to abandon the match. So they're about to suspend it. The game's off. Players are gone, old Bill on the pitch. 
You know, I've never witnessed that before. Game's off. It's a shame I was enjoying it. Look. I've probably been to more than 100 games in England and seen no trouble. But the first one I go to in Argentina gets called off because of a riot. You know, just, just the old Bill ain't got no, no control over it whatsoever. It's still kicking off now, it's murders over it. The thinking behind the actions of the racing firm is a twisted sense of loyalty and support for their team. Racing's people, they think, OK, before they make they make a lot of goals, we sus suspend the match, OK? We, we finish the match because here in Argentina, supporters think that they can play. This is a way of playing. So they've stopped the game and avoided a humiliation on the pitch. They believe they've helped their team. The police try and clear them by hosing them down, but that can't dampen their spirits. After all, in their minds, they've won. Just singing, singing in the rain. It had been a strange day. I'd witnessed firsthand the highs and lows of Argentinian football. It was obvious that what Babate had said about violence being on a decrease had to be taken with a handful of salt. The production line of football violence in the Argentinian factory was fully operational. The next morning, I discovered that the violence we'd seen at the match had sparked a major storm. This basically says the war against violence has started. As of today, the Argentinian FA have had enough. And it stems from the Independiente racing game that we was at. For the last four games of the season, away fans would be banned from travelling to games, and any teams whose fans cause trouble would have points deducted. It's mad that we've come right into the eye of the storm at this point. This is, a, this is big news. I mean, this is all through the paper. It's like, it's, ma it's massive, you know? Everywhere I turned, the story was all over the media. There was lots of talk, lots of hot air. The level of debate in Argentinian football is really, really high. You can sit and talk football and talk the structure of football for hours. But when it comes to making rational conclusions about the problems of Argentinian football, it never seems to happen. This wasn't the first time the authorities had threatened to clean up the game. Over here, they'd seen and heard it all before. No one wants to take responsibility for the, for the problem. It's all someone else's responsibility. The directors will say this is the responsibility of the authorities. The authorities will say this is the responsibility of the directors. The players will say this has nothing to do with us. Who does it have something to do with? It seems that everyone's talking, but nobody's saying anything, including the hooligans. Everyone had gone silent, and I thought nobody was going to tell me what's going on. But coming up next, I'll get to hear from a firm who break the silence. How's your luck? I turn up in Buenos Aires at the same time as one of the biggest crises in the history of Argentinian football violence. The game I went to had been called off because of a riot. Players had been threatened with death and away firms had been banned from travelling to games. I thought this scandal had nulled our chances of getting any more firms to talk. But despite the press attention, I managed to find a firm that were prepared to meet me. But were they going to tell me anything? I'm off to the most westerly barrio in Buenos Aires called Linears, to the home of Vélez Sarsfield. You've probably not heard of them, neither would I. But in 1994, they were world champions, beating the great Milan side of the 90s. They're not one of the most famous teams in Argentina, but they're a big part of the community. And so is their firm, the Pandilla. For these guys, the firm is like the family. We don't have a chief. Here is democratic. We are friends. We grow up here in the club. We began to, to travel with the gang and then we 
we form part of them. Here they are kicking off after a game against Boca Juniors in April 2006. Now they're not the most active firm in Buenos Aires, but I was grateful that they were going to talk to me. I didn't quite know what to expect, but to say I was in for a surprise would be an understatement. Hooligans getting you on the pitch in their club. How mad is that? It's mental, it's insane. First of all, I want to ask you, how many of you are in your firm? We are about 250 and 300 between that number. We don't have biggest enemies everywhere. Everyone are enemies. We don't have friends here. Like Bobota Independiente, they didn't say much about the violence, but they did at least admit to being involved. The fight here uh, never are organized. It's always spontaneous, OK? If we cross over each within, uh, between other, we fight. It's the only rule, okay? OK? We don't organize anything. Although the interview didn't reveal much, everything else that happened did. First of all, the club provided us with some refreshments. OK, see that? They, they trade here, us very well, OK? Never know the firms with their own butler. How mad is that? Look, there he goes, look, the old butler, look, he's on his way. Up he goes, look. Salud. After a couple of unpitched beers, the boys took me inside to show me the trophy room. Now, are you following this? The firm are taking me to see the trophy room. No one stopped us. Nobody asked us what we were doing. I was obviously with people of some influence. Uh, they were obviously quite pally with the president. The president's just through there. Uh, I don't know if he's going to make an appearance or not. I don't know, I don't know how it works. The Pandia seemed to be more than just your average football firm. They'd shown me around the place as if it was theirs. They were pals of the president and weren't just tolerated, but respected. It seemed that they were an integral part of the club. Could it be that in Argentina, the lunatics really had taken over the asylum? Every club has a Barra Brava. There's no team uh, without Barra Brava. You can have no goalie, you can have no defender, you can have no forward, but you'd ha you should have to have a Barra Brava. So what about Bobote, the head of the Independiente Barra Bravas? Well, I found out that he too appeared to have friends in high places. Now, Bobote, the leader of the Independiente mob who took us to the game was actually banned from going. Now, it's been alleged by no less than the governor of Buenos Aires that the president of the club let him get in early. He's also accused Bobote of selling 600 illegal tickets for the game. You know? It's, like, it's all very, very strange. The Barras Bravas is a job when people choose to become a Barra Brava, uh, it's not just a job, it's a way of life. It's a way of life. Professional hooligans. How on earth does that work? Well, it's all about the structure of the football clubs. Unlike in England, where they run as companies, in Argentina, they run as associations. So fans can become members of the club and get to vote for the president. In England, they were always companies. In Argentina, it's more the model of associations where the members vote for the president. So that being the president is an elected position. So if you want to be the president, you need the votes from the terraces. Whoever controls the terraces, therefore controls a lot of votes. And the Barra brothers control the terraces. If you've got your own renter mob gang that can impress some, intimidate others, that's very, very important. And it's about more than just collecting votes. The Barra Brothers will do the dirty work of the clubs. Let's put uh, an example. Uh, a club wants to fire their manager. The manager doesn't want to go. So the president of the club sends Barra Bravas, and the manager finally leaves. In England, the hooligans grew up outside the orbit of the clubs. In Argentina, the clubs have created the gangs of hooligans. So that's how I think Argentine football created a monster. These gangs have historically been subsidized by the club. They get money from players, from trainers, 
from president of the club. They get free tickets, they get their travel expenses covered. Siendo barra brava, tenés acceso a abogados, tenés acceso a contactos con la policía. Si caes preso, el club te, te pone la seguridad como para sacarte, te escolta la policía. O sea, es, es un trabajo violento protegido. So the Barra Brothers are allegedly into major criminal activity, not just fighting one another, but extortion, match fixing and widespread corruption. And everyone seems to know that it's going on. So why has nothing ever been done? We decided to approach the police and see what they had to say. And their silence spoke volumes. Now we've had a few knockbacks on the police before about giving interviews, you know, usually because you know, they don't want to be part of our show. They feel that we're glamorizing hooligans, all this sort of stuff. In Buenos Aires, it's a different story. The reason the police won't go on camera is because the situation with the Barris Brothers is so volatile at the moment that they're frightened of repercussions. You know, they're meant to be law and order. You know, I think for me, it just rams home. And naughty, these are these Barris Brothers. They're, they're, you know, they're a proper outfit, you know? They are like, like little mafias, you know? It's, it's very similar uh, uh, to the uh, Italian mafias. The influence of the Barra brothers can be seen at the very pinnacle of the game here. Twice a year in Buenos Aires, a fixture takes place that some argue is the biggest match in the world. It's one of the world's great derbies. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's more important than Real Madrid, Barcelona or Manchester, Liverpool. It's the most important match all over the world. Yep, it's even bigger than West Ham Millwall. River Plate versus Boca Juniors is the meeting of the two most successful teams in Argentina and the two biggest firms. The television coverage of a Boca River game shows just how much the Barra brothers are part of the fabric of football. Así va llegando parte de la hinchada de Boca aquí a la cancha de River Plate. This isn't the teams turning up at the ground. It's one of the firms. Incredibly, their arrival is covered live on television and is even commentated on. Ahí están los más caracterizados de River, los llamados borrachos del tablón. Now I might be wrong, but I don't recall the ICF ever being featured on Match of the Day. No, pero mira lo que es eso, mira. Le pega es más grande el brazo de él que la pierna mía. <laughs> Both <laughs> clubs emerge from the Boca area of Buenos Aires, and like all local rivals, they've forever been at each other's throats. River's firm are called Los Borrachos de Tablón, or the drunks of the terraces, and they came onto the scene in the 70s. They're so powerful, they have a place reserved bang in the middle of the terrace. Little tip for you, don't stand there. After a lot of negotiations, I finally got to meet up with one of their firm, Kevin. He didn't want to show his face, so maybe he was going to be more open about the Barras brothers' role in the violence in Argentina. Now, preparados for pelear? No, no sé si estamos ahora por deporte, uno por ahí va al gimnasio o, o, o hace gimnasia de boxeo o, o digamos preparados para pelear en las canchas no, no lo estamos. But despite being anonymous, Kevin ended up telling us nothing because the facts are that River has lots of form. Before a Libertadores Cup game in 2005, they attacked the coach of the opposition. There was fighting on the streets around the stadium, armed police and gunfire. No, no, no hay, no hay muchas confrontaciones. Obviously not. In the last 10 years, we only came across 50 reported incidents involving River. And at the start of the 2007 season, their stadium was closed because of violence caused by their fans. Now, I can't speak a lot of Spanish, but I'm no mug in any language. It was obvious that amongst the Barra brothers, there was some kind of code of silence. River's rivals, Boca Juniors, can be found in the heartland of the incredibly colourful Boca area of the city. The stadium is known as the Bombonera, or the Chocolate Box. Outside the ground, 
and many images of Boca Junior's favourite son, the man who for me was the greatest footballer ever. Diego, Diego, Diego. And after Maradona, their next most famous player is their number 12. That's the name of their firm, La Dosse. Boca Juniors are one of the most famous clubs in the world. And La Dosse, one of the most notorious firms. La Dosse have been involved in more than 100 incidents of football violence down the years. They've kicked off with just about everyone. This riot on the streets of Buenos Aires in 2003 came as a result of a famous Boca victory. It's a good job they don't often lose. And this is their main man, Rafa De Zeo, seen here orchestrating the arrival of La Dosse at the River Game. He doesn't only direct his own boys, he even tells the police where to go. Since 1999, the authorities here have been trying to put Rafa away for football violence, and he even has a three-year and ten-month prison sentence hanging over him. Obviously, this is not a man to be messed with, and so I made sure I got to our meeting early. It's not every day you get an audience with the leader of what is commonly recognised as the biggest firm in the world. I've been told to wait at a petrol station, all cloak and dagger, all don't know what, where we're going, you know. Um, now this geezer is like a living legend here, you know. He's almost the Maradona of hooligans, you know. They all respect him. He's quite an older, uh, you know, I've not met this guy yet. He's, he's a bit older and, you know, but obviously a very dangerous man. So it's all very Godfather-esque for me, you know what I mean? It's all very Godfather, mafioso, um, quite, you know, quite intimidating, I must say. I was kept waiting for almost an hour. It didn't help my nerves. They were taking a battering. Eventually I was met by Rafa's people. One of his lieutenants, a man known as the Ninja, was driving us to another venue. I thought it might be a new flyover and that I was gonna be part of it. But thankfully, I was taken to a pizzeria. So this is it, Italian pizza, the godfather, Rafa De Zeo. Let's see what this guy's got to say. They didn't seem to care who I was. They were calling the shots here. I was more than a little nervous. What um what is the role of the dossier at the club? In the club is y digamos es la una de las patas fuertes del club. Tiene mucha influencia por el hecho de que uno vive desde chiquito en el club. Va todos los días su vida al club. En cambio los jugadores o los dirigentes están por un tiempo determinado, pero después se terminan yendo. A la 12 está desde que nace hasta que se muere. Is La Dosse the hardest firm in Argentina? Sí. Sí. Sí, es la más fuerte. Para nosotros, no solo de Argentina. Para nosotros, no solo de Argentina. Los sino, lo y los demás, digamos, en distintos países del mundo reconocen que la hincha de boca es la más fuerte de casi todo el mundo. Okay. Y, y que no lo decimos nosotros, lo dice la gente de afuera. Finally, it felt like someone was actually telling me something. De una pelea. En realidad es una pelea y uno trata de no hablar mucho de eso porque la pelea queda siempre ahí, en lo que fue una pelea. Simplemente sí, nos peleamos, pasó tal cosa, eh, ganamos o no, y normalmente ganamos, pero eh, no hablamos mucho del tema. Para nosotros la hinchada de boca es como una familia. Entonces tratamos de los problemas de la familia que no salgan de ahí. Porque el mundo de nosotros es más cerrado. El mundo nuestro es más cerrado 
Porque no nos gusta que las cosas que hacemos nosotros salgan para afuera, para el exterior. I realize that in Argentina there are some things that strangers like me don't get told about. Certain things stay within the family. So if football hooliganism is such a closed and powerful world, will the problems of violence ever go away? In a very short time in Argentina, I'd learned that football hooliganism here was unlike anywhere else in the world. It's as much a part of the game here as penalties and pies. So if it is so deep within the fabric of football, will the problems of violence ever leave the game? One suggestion is to look at the country which managed to cure what was always known as the English disease. Many people are currently holding up the English example as the road for Argentina to follow. And the English state, when it went for the problem of football hooliganism, it did it seriously. Uh, I think that the Argentinian government has to have the same willing that the government of the United Kingdom had 20 years ago to solve the problem. So that means all seated stadiums, banning orders and strict punishment for convicted hooligans. In England, football was sanitized and if the same road is to be followed in Argentina, what will happen to the passion that is so much part of the game here? It would be sad if, if, if such a thing had to happen in Argentina because you would lose so much of, of the terrorist culture, which is a wonder to behold. And I know that, because in the first half of the Independiente game, I had an amazing experience. But the second half could have ended in tragedy, and tragedy is no stranger to Argentinian football. It's a life or death question. But you have to make a choice. If we have to eliminate the passion just to eliminate the atrocities, well, I can buy. For me, it's, it's very important that uh, the football will not bring any more death in, in Argentina. But Argentina's challenge is even tougher than England's because here, the hooligans have real influence. The problem is the hooligans are inside the structure of football. That wasn't the case in England, and that makes the whole thing of eradicating the problem much more serious because you've got people there inside football with a vested interest who don't want to clear up the problem. La violencia es algo muy frecuente hoy en día en Argentina, siempre lo fue y hoy lo sigue siendo. Lo que pasa que hoy parece que tiene más poder la 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 hinchada o toda la gente que los controles que pueden llegar a ver. At the start of the 2007 season, the measures implemented during the crisis were dropped and the Barra Bravas were allowed back into games. But Rafa De Zayo is now serving his jail sentence for football violence. The authorities appear to be taking the first steps to combat the problems, but they face a battle against those who believe they have the real power. Yo estoy en, en el club de los siete años. Y desde los siete años a hoy pasaron un montón de jugadores, un montón de, de dirigentes y nosotros seguimos estando. Por eso tiene, tiene o sea, la fuerza que tiene la hinchada dentro del club. To see webisodes of Real Football Factors International, log on to bravo.co.uk forward slash Real Football Factors International to check out the shape of global hooliganism.